Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present at today's conference. It's, uh, it's fabulous to be here and it's extraordinary to see uh, so many people here in the room. Congratulations to Faisal and Tony and their respective teams at Camco and Bergam Bank. Um, clearly they've tapped into some significant demand uh, at today's event and hopefully this will be the first of many such events that uh, we get to enjoy here in Kuwait. Um, I am um, here I think to provide some context uh, to talk a little bit about some of the things that business leaders and investors around the world are and perhaps should be thinking about. Uh, and I've entitled this presentation, Navigating Global Volatility. Um, and clearly, we are living in volatile times. It feels like we're living that Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Um, I work for the Economist Intelligence Unit. We are the forecasting division of the Economist Group. Um, one thing I think to note uh, as I start is that many of you, of course, will know the newspaper. Uh, and you will know that The Economist is quite a political organ. It likes to tell its readers how it thinks the world should be. Um, at The Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, we don't layer that world view on our own analysis. We simply tell people how we think the world is and how we think the world will be. Um, so no political lectures from me, not that that would be appropriate uh, in any case, but I still find it relatively useful to share some of the recent covers of The Economist, just to illustrate some of the things that we're talking about. Uh, and here are, are six themes uh, that perhaps set the scene for the business and investment and social environments uh, in which we find ourselves at the moment. So I think we're looking at peak China. I think we are at a stage now where we can't necessarily expect China ever to return to those heady days of high single digit and low double digit growth. Uh, that's because uh, China's economy is normalizing, but also China is facing some significant structural issues characterized by the three Ds. Uh, high debt, uh, demographic change, a shrinking population, and some deflationary pressures in China. So China uh, is unlikely, we think, to overtake the US in terms of becoming the world's biggest economy as quickly as we had previously forecast. But nevertheless, that competition between China and the US is likely to characterize certainly the rest of our working lives. Um, and, uh, and that leads me on to my second cover there. Uh, and one character is obviously looming large on the world stage uh, at the beginning of 2024 as we enter uh, election year in the US. In fact, we're entering election year for many, many countries around the world. Uh, this is probably the biggest election year ever in the history of the world. Uh, countries with a population of more than 4 billion go to the polls this year. Um, and many of those are going to be quite significant. Uh, we've already seen, for example, elections in Taiwan. Um, which might indeed uh, influence what happens there in the South China Sea and, and China's intentions uh, on Taiwan itself. But with regards to the US presidential election, it seems increasingly likely uh, that it will be a rerun of Biden versus Trump. Of course, we know, because we've got experience of both men in the White House, in the Oval Office, so we kind of know what to expect depending on the outcome. Uh, and various commentators have put the chances of Mr. Trump winning the presidential election at somewhere between 30 and 50%, assuming he can overcome his legal challenges. So that's a, quite a significant chance of a return for Mr. Trump. And if that happens, uh, then we're likely to see greater protectionism. We're likely to see a much more transactional approach to diplomacy and trade in the way that we came to expect that before. Um, we're also probably going to see uh, U.S. withdrawal of financial and military support to Ukraine. So the expectation that other uh, supporters of uh, Vladimir Zelensky will have to step up. Inflation is still with us uh, and higher uh, for higher and for longer than I think we and a lot of uh, central bankers expected. Uh, inflation has proved to be much more sticky uh, and therefore 
um, monetary policy tightening has had to go harder and further. Uh, and that has provided something of a drag on growth. We are seeing inflation starting to come down now. Um, and everyone is looking out at the moment for that pivot point, the moment uh, in which those central banks, particularly the Fed, European Central Bank and the Bank of England, decide then to start loosening monetary policy and reducing interest rates. And I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Uh, artificial intelligence is very much on everyone's minds at the moment. Questions about the extent to which it's going to make us more efficient, more productive, and then bigger questions about whether or not ultimately it's going to be a threat to jobs. Um, lots of thinking about the kind of jobs that artificial intelligence and automation could do. Again, we'll stick with the Ds. We can look at dirty jobs, difficult jobs, dull jobs, dangerous jobs, dear or expensive jobs. Those are the kind of things where artificial intelligence and automation could really uh, improve uh, the workplace. Um, and I think our view and the view of most business leaders is that all things are possible with artificial intelligence. We're really at the beginning of this journey. 2024 could be quite a big year for artificial intelligence. It'll be a year when businesses really start to adopt it, when techies really start to improve it, and when regulators meaningfully start to regulate it. So artificial intelligence um, very much on the minds of business leaders and, of course, of governments and regulators. Uh, green growth, sustainability. We've just had COP28 uh, in Dubai, which finished, of course, with a pledge, with a commitment to reduce reliance on hydrocarbons. The challenge, I think, for the world is to try to decouple economic growth from emissions growth. And there are some quite clear evidence out there to suggest that for every one percentage point of GDP growth enjoyed by emerging markets, there's a commensurate 0.7% growth in emissions. And that's the thing that the world has to work hard to decouple. And then finally, I've just put that slide there about the new Middle East. Um, I think the Middle East is at a really exciting junction at the moment, notwithstanding uh, the recent geopolitical developments. Um, and that is because as East and West bifurcates, as we see greater polarization between the West, the hegemonic powers of the West, and what we might now call the Global South, um, there is an opportunity for those of us that are both geographically and politically in the middle to be the bridge, to be the positive influencers on both sides, to remain friends with both sides and to reap the benefits of those continued relations with the East and with the West. I think it's going to be tricky diplomatically. Clearly, America and China are going to be trying to force their allies to choose sides. But for those that can resist those siren calls, I think there's a significant opportunity. Um, let's start then with a, a macroeconomic outlook. And I will share with you our global growth forecasts. And then we'll funnel that down to what we see happening in the region. This is our hexagonal map of the world. Hopefully, you can recognize its shape and see the, the hot spots and the not spots in terms of growth. Uh, high growth represented by the reds and the oranges, slow growth represented by the greens and the blues. Globally, uh, GDP growth this year forecast to be 2.3%, something of a reduction uh, from the 2.5% experience last year. And in fact, last year was a much better year than we had anticipated. If I was doing this presentation 12 months ago, I'd have probably been forecasting growth of 1.7% last year. But the US performed much better than we expected. Um, Europe avoided the recessions that many people were forecasting. And we saw significantly faster growth from certain emerging markets, which really drove that overall growth picture. Some of the um, highlights there on the screen, uh, China achieved about 5.5% growth last year in line with, with forecasts. But we think Chinese growth will fizzle out. And actually, over the course of our forecast period, Chinese growth will slow to around 3% towards the end of this decade. Um, in Africa, the growth story there is focused on the middle-sized economies, the Kenyas, the Ugandas, the Tanzanias, the Ethiopias. And it's the larger economies in Africa that continue to disappoint, the South Africas, the Nigerias, for example. And then in Asia, 
uh, it's the people, it's the countries that are the beneficiaries of those supply chain shifts that we see as a result of, of geopolitical tension. Uh, many of you will have heard of, uh, of China plus one strategies where multinational companies in particular looking to de-risk uh, their supply chains and looking for other places to invest across the world um, where they can uh, diversify their supply chains and reduce their reliance and risk on countries where uh, there may well be further geopolitical tensions emerging. So Vietnam, Bangladesh are very much growing fast as a result of those inward investments coming in from multinationals in particular. Uh, we think India is going to have a very fine decade indeed as it adds manufacturing heft to its service sector strengths uh, and India is, is definitely going to be one of the fastest growth economies uh, in the world over the next few years as well as now uh, the world's most populous economy. Uh, in our region here, nothing particularly exciting, I suppose, in terms of GDP growth, although that 2.4% average this year is both an improvement on last year's growth picture and, of course, something that uh, covers a wide variety of performance uh, from the different countries of our region. Um, this chart here, uh, perhaps a little complicated, forgive me for those at the back if you can't quite make it out, but what I've done here is I've plotted GDP growth uh, year on year, put that in as a compound annual growth rate, and you can therefore see how many of the region's economies are likely to grow over the course of the next few years and how much bigger they will be by 2028 than they were in 2022. Um, Qatar there leading the field, leading the charge, Nothing to do with a World Cup bounce, nothing to do with any particular success in diversification from hydrocarbons. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, 2026 will be the year that the Northfield East gas terminal comes on, online. And of course, you've got many of the world's, and particularly European countries, lining up at the doors of Doha asking to buy gas because those European countries trying to wean themselves off Russian gas and looking for alternative supplies. So a significant bounce there for Qatar in the latter part of our forecast period. Egypt having a tough time at the moment, although of course, according to this graph, we are expecting Egypt to grow um, and grow relatively fast, especially towards the end of our forecast period. They're having a tough time of it at the moment, um, very much supported by the IMF uh, we're expecting a significant currency devaluation this year um, as it tries to solve its balance of payments problems. A UAE, very steady, steady annual growth there will take its economy to nearly a quarter bigger uh, by 2028 than it was in 2022. But these are the dividends that the UAE is, is, is reaping now from that diversification journey uh, that it has taken itself on. A journey, of course, that uh, Saudi, is really starting to take seriously. You might be surprised to see Saudi so far down that league table. It's a bit of an unfair graph in the sense that in 2021 to 2022, of course, Saudi uh, was the world's uh, fastest growing economy at 9%, so it's, it's competing against those comparables. Uh, but nevertheless, um, clearly a lot of excitement about what's happening in the kingdom, uh, a lot of investment heading that way. And then Kuwait there, uh, propping up the league table, I'm sad to say, but again, indicating that Kuwait is really at the start of its own diversification journey. I think this illustrates uh, the need, illustrates the requirement for, for action in this regard, uh, especially as we've seen those global commitments now for countries to wean themselves off hydrocarbons. Uh, Kuwait, I think, needs to get real with its own diversification journey. Um, and, and this is why, in some respects, um, oil prices, we're expecting them to trend down for a variety of reasons, although, of course, there are significant upside risks to oil prices and oil price forecasts. Um, but with countries in our region still very much dependent on oil for, for fiscal income, uh, anything that starts to see oil fall below those fiscal break-even points, and I've marked Saudis there at about $80 a barrel for this year, um, for Kuwait, the estimate is, is higher still, just over $90 a barrel. Anything below that will see those countries uh, running a negative um, budget balance. And that will be difficult, and it will mean difficult choices in terms of investment. Uh, so, uh, so oil still remains an important 
a benchmark for the oil dependent countries of our region um, and we are expecting that to, to step down over the years ahead. As we are expecting inflation to step down and you can see there on the left our uh, forecasts for inflation over the next few years coming down off the peaks of 2022 uh, and settling particularly for uh, emerging markets at around 4% and for developed uh, economies at around 2%, somewhat higher than they were pre-pandemic and pre-the war in Ukraine. One impact of that has been a challenge to wages, uh, and we've seen cost of living squeezes in many parts of the world as wage growth has fallen behind price growth. Uh, we are expecting for 2024 uh, wage growth to go ahead now of inflation, but probably not enough to make up for the shortfall that we saw in 2021 and 2022. So the consumer is not feeling particularly wealthy at the moment in many parts of the world. And given that it was the consumer uh, that prevented some of those major economies from slipping into recession uh, in 2022, um, that softness of the consumer markets and consumer demand is likely to persist uh, for a couple of years at least. Um, and I mentioned that uh, with those higher rates of inflation, central banks have been trying to tame those inflation levels uh, by tightening monetary policy. This extraordinary sort of step ladder shaped graph here, I think, shows the story very clearly. Those very rapid step ups in interest rates from uh, the Fed, from the ECB, and from the Bank of England. Of course, for those of us in the GCC with uh, economies whose uh, currencies are pegged to the dollar, we're on that pretty much that same roller coaster ride that the Fed takes us on. Um, but you can see that we think that uh, those interest rates have now topped out at their current levels, 5.25 uh, to 5% for the Fed funds rate. Um, but we think that the next move will be downwards. And you can see our forecast there for interest rates stepping down over the course of the next few years. But again, landing at a rate higher uh, than those ultra accommodative rates that we saw. Uh, pre-pandemic. So interest rates uh, for the US probably at around uh, two and a half to two and three quarter percent uh, and stabilizing there from 2026 onwards. Um, in terms of the regional view, I mentioned at the beginning that I think actually this is quite an exciting time uh, for the Middle East and we um, conduct a survey every year called the Middle East Business Outlook Survey, hence MIBOS. And the sentiment among the business community um, that we poll is largely positive. In fact, actually, there wasn't a single negative response at all. The worst that we got was a sense of neutrality from about 7% of respondents. But you can see a similar number expressing optimism and slight optimism for the business environment uh, in the uh, in the year ahead, uh, in the years ahead, I should say, five year outlook. So, so very positive view, notwithstanding some of the regional challenges that are emerging at the moment. Um, another complicated slide with a lot of detail. I will share these with uh, with our friends from Camco and, and Bergan, and they can perhaps um, put them on their website for you to explore in detail later. But I think this is significant, and we measure. Um, the favorability of business environments in economies all around the world on 11 different measures, and you can see some of those, so the political environment, um, economic environment, market access, uh, attitudes towards the private sector, um, how conducive the markets are to foreign direct investments, um, tax policy, finance policy, labor market policy, infrastructure, tech readiness, lots of different things that go into making up this business environment index. Um, and it's important because there is quite a strong correlation between those countries that have generated a positive business environment and uh, the investment flows into those economies. Uh, so you can see from the table at the bottom left there that within the region, the UAE uh, achieves the highest score in our business environment index rating. Uh, and actually, it puts them in pretty good company. Their business environment is considered to be more attractive than the UK, than France, than Japan, than Taiwan. They've worked very hard on a number of those measures to ensure that their business environment is conducive and attractive to investment. Um, Saudi, obviously, uh, wants more 
investment. They want more in-country value, and they're working hard, I think, to close the gap. We're seeing more and more competition between Saudi and the UAE. Many of you will know about the uh, regional headquarters initiative that um, compels multinationals to uh, have a regional headquarters in Saudi if it wants to continue to access public sector and PIF works. Um, and I think the question is there, you know, have they got the right balance between carrot and stick to ensure that organizations want to be there and are willing to make those investments? Um, for Kuwait, obviously room for improvement on a number of those measures. Uh, there are some very positive aspects of Kuwait's business environment, uh, but also some significant areas of challenge. Uh, those in red, uh, attitude towards the private sector, foreign direct investment, market access, and of course uh, the political scene, all of those remain challenging uh, in terms of the business environment. And those are the areas I think that we're going to get into when we have our panel discussion imminently. And you can see up on the top right there uh, that foreign direct investment in Kuwait and we've measured this uh, based on inward foreign direct investment on a per capita basis, remains a very thin, thin line in respect of uh, the levels that we're seeing, particularly in the UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, Oman, and Saudi. So work to do there to, to encourage more foreign direct investment. Um, back to our survey. Again, we asked our, our business leaders in the region how they rated the business environment uh, in the various economies of the region. And to a large extent, they line up with, with what we were saying. Uh, actually, Kuwait there, um, in line with Bahrain, um, and, uh, and again, slightly behind the UAE, Saudi, and Qatar. So our own index uh, largely tallies, I think, with the sentiment of the business leadership community. And then if I plot those on this quadrant here, in terms of perceptions of risk and reward, uh, this is testing my knowledge of regional flags, um, but um, you can see there that those in the top right quadrant are the places where business leaders feel that the reward for doing business is high and the risk of doing business is low. And that, I guess, is where uh, countries need to be in order to attract um, that investment uh, and, uh, and interest uh, from the wider market. So the UAE is up there, Saudi is there. High reward, uh, slightly higher risk than the UAE. You've got Qatar, high reward, low risk, uh, and you've got Oman there on the cusp uh, of reward, but again, relatively low risk. And, and we've got Kuwait there right slap bang in the middle. So considerations of reward, middling, considerations of risk, middling, but again, think about policies and how uh, the government uh, can improve that so that perceptions of reward are higher, and perceptions of risk start to reduce. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I think I'm going to be at risk of running out of time, but um, investments uh, expected, again, to be directed largely to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, with some of the other countries of the region, including Egypt, Kuwait, and Qatar, following behind. And then I think the other aspect is livability. Uh, as well as creating a conducive business environment, governments also working hard to ensure that uh, the countries of our region are places where people want to come and work and invest. And again, we're seeing a lot of effort on that front by particularly the UAE, increasingly by Saudi. And actually, Kuwait scores relatively well on this measure, uh, highest actually for healthcare in the region, reasonably well uh, placed for education, penalized, I guess. <coughs> excuse me, penalized, I guess, a little bit for considerations around culture and environment. And so, again, clear, uh, clear direction there for what could be improved to make Kuwait uh, a more livable destination. Right. Got about three and a half minutes to talk about geopolitics, um, which is not that complicated at the moment, right? Um, so let's have a look at the risks that we see uh, across the world. And our forecasts are always tempered by both upside and downside risks. What are the things that might happen uh, that might derail those growth forecasts? And we split those into political risks, uh, into military risks, into economic and environmental risks. And here are our top 10. Notable, actually, that, uh, that Ukraine has fallen off our top 10 
um, this year. Uh, and that would be a big worry for uh, President Vladimir Zelensky. And this is his concern that all these other things that are happening in the world takes global attention away from his mission uh, to defeat Russia's invasion. Um, so it's still there, and it, we think that's going to be a long, drawn-out conflict, particularly if Trump accedes to the Oval Office and starts to withdraw U.S. support. But, of course, Ukraine, not the only military risk. We have conflict back uh, in the Middle East and the risk that that becomes contagious and spreads. Uh, and, of course, this concern about China's motives on Taiwan. And, and of course, if we saw any uh, significant... Um, escalation of tensions in the South China Sea, then that would really uh, further polarize relations between China and the West. Um, some political risk there and, and the change in the US administration uh, that we forecast potentially for the end of this year, significant. Uh, and there we are, artificial intelligence and potential for artificial intelligence to, to disrupt elections, uh, potentially also uh, its involvement in cybercrime, these could be significant things uh, for us to watch out for and which could derail um, our, our forecasts. Um, in terms of what's happening uh, up the road in, in Palestine, I think the concerns economically, and uh, first of all, um, I think it's woefully inadequate of me to stand here and talk about what's happening there in respect of economics and what's happening to oil prices given uh, the, the humanitarian crisis. But nevertheless, I think we are already seeing significant changes to um, logistics and shipping as, as uh, operators try to avoid the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandar Strait. So that's adding two weeks to, uh, to shipping times. It's adding significant cost to shipping times not actually anywhere near the spikes that we saw in 2021, around the time of the pandemic and, uh, and, and then into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but nevertheless, um, back to their highest point since late 2022 as, as ships try to avoid the Red Sea given those Houthi attacks. Um, and then the other story, of course, and I've mentioned the, uh, the splits that we're starting to see between the West and the Global South and we have five new members to BRICS. Uh, those are Saudi, Iran, Ethiopia, uh, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. Not actually in the end Argentina, who decided to not join in the end following their elections, but a significant organization in terms of their potential influence, significant in terms of population, significant in terms of GDP, a group now that is bigger than the EU, a group now that is bigger than the G7, and of course a group that has significant uh, oil production between them given the accession of those uh, new oil uh, producing members. But hard to see actually what BRICS and the BRICS group now might want to achieve. They are a, a quite a disparate group. Any club that contains both Saudi and Iran uh, might have significant policy differences. We could say the same for any group that includes China and India. So hard to perceive that there will be uh, a, a unified voice on many issues, perhaps except for one, and that is uh, reducing dependence on the West, and particularly reducing dependence on the US and reducing dependence on the dollar. So de-dollarization might be a significant theme for the countries represented now by the enlarged BRICS group and those that also want to join over the coming years. We don't see any significant threat to the US dollar as the global reserve currency, uh, but we do expect that countries that want to do more bilateral trade in non-dollar terms uh, will uh, be motivated to do so. Um, I've run out of time for my session and uh, I don't want to eat into my panelists' discussion, so let me just uh, zoom through to this, because I think this is significant. Um, as this east-west divide uh, deepens, as this polarization really starts to take effect, I think we are likely to see the return of industrial policy. And by that I mean whereby countries around the world really start to prioritize their own requirements and start to hold on to and limit um, supplies of critical um, minerals and, and other important commodities to 
countries that they consider to be competitors. So components for um, the electric um, vehicle industry, for example, for green industry, uh, those critical minerals, aspects of AI. We can see governments citing national security, the promotion of domestic employment uh, and growth and resilience as being all important aspects that mean that it, they may start to restrict uh, access to markets, restrict access to finance, restrict access to technology uh, for countries that they don't consider to be their friends. And again, you can see this very much coming out of the Trump playbook. And what does this mean? I'll finish on this slide here. The growing risks of tech bifurcation. Not just technology, but a risk of bifurcation um, that means that we could see more restrictions on software and apps, hardware, specific technologies such as microchips, uh, sales indeed of products and services to specific countries, and all of those things have already happened, but take it to its logical conclusion and we could see a future in which we have a splinter net. Two or more incompatible technologies between East and West, and that will be a very difficult place for multinationals and for countries that hope to be both geographically and politically in the middle uh, to operate. Um, and that feeds back into my theme that I think the opportunity and the risk for those of us that are in the middle are clear and present. We need to ensure that we can maintain solid relations with both sides uh, as those relations deteriorate and perhaps actually even to be the influence for good in terms of how those relationships might develop. Okay, I'm going to leave that there now. There was more to say, but uh, I think that's probably enough from me.